Hi, welcome to the Bioinformatics chat. Today we will be talking about plasmids and uh, joining me today are Anita Schurch. Hi, Anita. Hi. And Sergio Arredondo. Hi, Sergio. Hi, Roman. Let's uh, start with a brief primer on plasmids and maybe on bacterial genetics in, in general. Uh, so, well, we are interested in, in plasmids because, uh, well, plasmids in general, there are um, sequences, autonomous sequences in uh, bacteria cells. So we have a, a chromosome and often extra chromosomal elements, plasmids, which uh, can replicate independently. So bacteria, they like uh, eukaryotes, they have chromosomes, right? But usually just a single chromosome. So uh, you have a single cell indeed, and there's a single chromosome inside it, most often a single chromosome, and uh, well, which is basically like a single string of DNA. But next to this uh, single chromosome, we often have also other DNA elements, which are also circular, like the chromosome, uh, but most often uh, much smaller than a chromosome. And uh, these pieces of DNA, uh, plasmids, they can replicate independently of the chromosome. So they are like small selfish elements within the bacterial genome. And when you say they replicate separately, what, what does it mean? Do they have their own sort of replication cycle? So they replicate more often than the main chromosome? They have their own uh, replication machinery, indeed. And uh, they can be in a, in a much larger copy number than the chromosome, but that's not uh, always the case. Uh, especially if we have uh, bacterial plasmids which carry uh, antibiotic resistance genes, uh, these do often uh, replicate at a similar rate as the, as the chromosome. So they have also a single copy number. And well, the um, the resistance genes, the antibiotic resistance gene, it's also one of the reasons why we are so interested in plasmids. So uh, uh, we work often with uh, commensal bacteria, enterococci, which uh, live in the intestines of uh, of everyone. So every person carries them, and uh, they don't do much harm, but they can also trigger infection especially in hospitalized patients. And um, the bad thing is that they are also often associated with antibiotic resistance. So the antibiotics that are used to treat these infections, they become resistant to. And these resistance determinants, these genes that uh, confer the resistance, can be located on plasmids. Mm -hmm. And so the, what, what differentiates plasmids from chromosomes? Well, f first of all, plasmids are smaller, right? Uh, but also they can be more freely passed from, uh, one, uh, from one organism to another, from one bacterium to another, right? And, and that's how they spread this resistance? Yeah, that's, uh, that can be the case. So these plasmids can be transferred uh, between bacteria. Uh, it's what we call horizontal transfer, as opposed to vert vertical transfer, where uh, a mother cell uh, gives the genes to the daughter cells. Um, so that would be one mode of, uh, of uh, transfer, and that's mostly uh, when genes are located on the chromosome. But if they're on the plasmid, they can be horizontally transferred and also very rapidly transferred between different bacteria. Right, and knowing whether uh, a gene resides on a chromosome versus a plasmid, it may, may be pretty important, right? So, so you analyze some data uh, from uh, vancomycin resistant enterococci. Can you talk about how that problem arose and uh, what you found there? Okay, so. Uh we work. We started to work with enterococci, and enterococci are uh, bacteria that each of us carry. It's uh, usually in our gut, and uh, doesn't pose any problems to healthy people. But it can lead to infection, uh, and then mostly in hospitalized patients. And it's also very prone to. Uh, 
picking up antibiotic resistance. So uh, you would uh, treat uh, um, uh, enterococci, for example, with vancomycin, which is a very strong antibiotic, but they also tend to get uh, resistant against vancomycin. And we see this vancomycin resistance enterococci uh, often in hospitals uh, all over the world and also in the Netherlands. So uh, what we did was to collect uh, vancomycin-resistant enterococci from Dutch hospitals in order to map the transmission of this vancomycin resistance. We were interested if uh, the transfer of uh, this resistance determinant would be uh, horizontal, thus uh, with plasmids, and uh, between bacteria or vertical, just from a mother uh, cell to a daughter cell. Right. So uh, in that study, uh, did you know in advance uh, what gene you were looking for? Like, was it easy to identify the gene itself in, let's say, the sequencing data? So usually it's quite easy to identify the vancomycin resistant gene. And there are like different variations of that resistant gene. Can be, for example, Van A, Van V, Van D. Uh, so usually that's not a problem. So we can easily identify what is the gene variation which is present in a in a bacterial isolate. It's what it's quite difficult to know is like whether that particular gene is present into the chromosome of the bacterial cell or if it maybe is located in a plasmid sequence. Do I understand correctly that the same gene might reside, like in, in some organisms, it might reside on the chromosome, in others on, on the plasmid? Like, is there, for example, recombination happening between the plasmids and the chromosome? Yes, that could be the case. So sometimes we find, for example, the vancomycin resistant gene A, we can find it in the chromosome, but usually it's uh, more located in the plasmids. But it, it can also be the case because they are present into transposon sequence, so that transposon can also jump into the chromosome. So it's it differs a lot between the bacterial isolate that you're studying. So uh, we, what we can see is like, there's usually a preference for a particular resistant gene to be located into the chromosome or to the plasmid, but you can also find it in the other way around. And so you wanted to figure out, right, uh, whether it, whether a given, let's say, sequence, right, that comes from the sequencer, whether it comes from the plasmid versus the chromosome. And that sounds like a very hard problem because how how can you possibly distinguish these, right? It, I, I understand like the, perhaps the only difference between them is that plasmid is a like a smaller chromosome, right? Uh, so how is it possible to algorithmically distinguish sequences from plasmids versus uh, chromosomes? So we actually asked the same question ourselves, and this is why we developed a benchmarking of different tools during the first part of our research in order to see what kind of features we could use in order to predict plasmid sequence. So there are like three main features that you can use and they can give you hints whether a sequence comes from a plasmid or comes from a chromosome. The first is, for example, the presence of replicant genes. That's what Anita was talking about before. So plasmids, they carry their own replication machinery. So if in that part of the sequence you also find replicant genes from plasmids, that can indicate whether that particular sequence comes from a plasmid. And that uh, gene would code for some protein, like for, for polymerase or something like that? Yes, exactly. It's quite similar to the DNA A that you can find in the chromosome. So it's, it's usually a replicase or relaxase. So it's part of the replication machinery of the plasmid, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, as I was saying, there's also two other features that you can use in order to distinguish sequence that come from plasmids or from the chromosome. Uh, one is, for example, the coverage that you encounter into those contexts. So coverage can be translated into the number of reads covering a particular nucleotide in your context. And that's also related to what you were discussing before. So because plasmids can be in a different copy number than the chromosome, you will expect that the coverage of the context belonging to the plasmids is going to differ, so are going to differ respect to the chromosome. So, for example, if, in, if a plasmid is in a copy number of five, you will expect that the coverage of context 
coming from that plasmid is five times higher than the coverage from the chromosome. So usually using that feature as well, you can really um, distinguish plasmids from chromosomes. There's only one limitation behind, which is plasmids that they have a very similar copy number to the chromosome, because then the coverage is going to be very similar to context coming from the chromosome. And you said something uh, that I should, I, I think we should elaborate on. So you, you said context, right, which implies that before you do this analysis, you sort of try to assemble. So you have your short sequencing reads, and you try to assemble them uh, the same way we assemble genomes. Uh, well, th this is a genome in a way. Um, and um, you work with these longer sequences because that allows you to find, for example, whether several genes are on the same uh, DNA strand. Yes, that's exactly correct. So what we usually do is whole genome sequencing of our isolates. And then we usually use uh, Illumina read sequencing. So we have short reads that can differ between f uh, 150 base pairs to 250 base pairs, depending on the technology that we are using. But then we try at an off assembly uh, using, for example, a spades that does uh, the Brian Graph assembly. And then in that way, what we try to do, as, as you have said, we try to elongate uh, those reads into longer pieces that that's what we call context because in that way we can uh, we can have more information in order to predict whether something comes from a plasmid or from a chromosome. And you mentioned the, the features of the sequence of the context that you use to predict uh, the plasmid DNA. So uh, one is the uh, the presence of these replication genes. Uh, the other one is the coverage, and what's the third one? It's, it's actually the K-mer composition. So um, there are some tools, for example, one that we have developed, it's called ML Plasmids, and that's based on uh, on uh, five mirrors frequencies. So the pentamers frequencies that you can find in plasmids and chromosome can differ. So what we actually did was to train different machine learning models using data sets in which we knew whether a contact was from a chromosome or from a plasmid. And then we tried to train those models in order to predict whether a contact was a plasmid or a chromosome. So actually, if you think about it from a machine learning point of view, it's a classification problem in which you have two classes, whether something is a plasmid or is a chromosome. And then from each prediction, you have a probability that the contact can belong to the plasmid class or to the chromosome class. That's very interesting. And why, uh, like, what made you make this conjecture that the Kamer composition would indicate uh, whether a uh, gene comes from a plasmid versus chromosome? Like, it sounds like you would just be learning the identity of those plasmids. So, of course, if you sort of um, remembered right a big data set of like many chromosomes, many plasmids, then you might be able to classify just based on the the similarity. Or, or do you think that the Kamer composition reveals something about the like the actual biology of the of these sequences? Yes, that, that's a really good question. I think it's quite difficult to know uh, what actually the models are using in order to classify something as plasmid or chromosome class. Uh, I think our feeling is like because of the chromosomes are shared between all the bacterial isolates that we are using, so they are much more conserved. So usually the composition of those chromosomes and those contexts belonging to the chromosome is much more stable. And rather than the plasmids, they can come from different backgrounds. As Anita said, those plasmids, for example, can be transferred from different bacterial species. So actually the composition of those plasmids is going to differ from the chromosome. And what sort of uh, predictive models have you have you tried to classify uh, based on the KMER spectra? So we actually uh, trained five different models. So we tried with logistic regression, then we also went for decision trees, uh, random forest, um, support vector machines, and uh, just a simple uh, Bayesian classifier. And then we compared them uh, in, our, in our test set, and based on the raw curves, we decided to stick for 
support vector machines also because the probabilities of being plasmid or to the chromosome class were very high which indicated that the prediction was actually quite we could trust in the prediction from from the model and uh, you said you're using illumina uh, to sequence your isolates uh, have you considered uh, using long reads would long reads address some of the issues with the uh, with short reads and like having to assemble them? Uh, long reads uh, can definitely solve the assembly problem and can help you to get uh, completely resolved uh, genomes, those uh, chromosomes and plasmids. So uh, yes, that helps a lot. And we also do use them, especially to train the ML plasmids classifier. Uh, the problem is that uh, at the moment we cannot... Uh, uh, long read sequence as many sequences or as many genomes as we would like. So we are, yeah, if we have uh, thousands and thousands of samples to be sequenced, I think the decision at the moment will still go for short read sequences, just cost wise. Uh, so uh, in order to get complete genomes, what we do with a, a selected number is that we uh, combine this. Uh, lo short read sequence genomes with uh, long reads and do a hybrid assembly. And uh, so that's that's one point, uh, the amount of sequences we want to generate, the amount of genomes we want to uh, sequence. And the other point is that in the databases, there are still a lot, a lot of data uh, from short read sequence genomes. Uh, from which we also would like to know if there are plasmids in there and what kind of genes they carry. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, in your in, in this specific study, I understand you're interested in a specific uh, bacterial uh, species. So um, I, I guess you try to culture them and then sequence just these uh, uh, enterococci. Um, do methods work equally well when this is like a metagenomic sample of uh, many different, like a, a mixture of many different uh, bacterial species? So actually, um, for example, if you're working with a different bacterial species, what we, we, what we have seen in G+, for example, the new tool that we are presenting is like the initial classification, whether something is plasmid or chromosome is very important. So for example, if you are using a classifier that has been trained for a general purpose, so for example, for uh, using in the test sets or the training sets, context from very different bacterial species, then usually the classification is not that good. And that can cause problems in the later binning of the plasmids. So, and of course, at this point, we are only working uh, with uh, single isolates. So we're not working with metagenomic sequence. Uh, because as, as you have said, uh, metagenomic sequence is like a much, uh, challenging problem because you have, uh, different bacterial species co-occurring in your assembly. And you also face other problems that you don't face in, uh, when you are working with, uh, single genomes. Now you mentioned that you use spades for, for your assembly. Um, and, uh, there is also meta spades, which I guess is not applicable because what you just said, that you're not working with metagenomic samples, right? But um, there's also something called plasmid spades. Can you talk about that and how it's different from like the normal spades? Yes, so in, in plasmid spades, what it does is it, it does like a first uh, assembly as, as for example, the normal default of spades. But then it tries to look at the second feature that I talked before, so it tries to look for difference in the coverage of context to classify whether something is plasmid or chromosome. So what it does, it tries to discard context that they have a coverage very similar to the, to the coverage that you obtain from the chromosome. And you can only do that because, as Anita said, uh, usually chromosomes are much larger than your plasmids. So if you calculate the median coverage of all your contexts, is going to resemble to the coverage that you expect from the chromosome. So that actually resembles like a normal distribution. And if you find contexts that are either to the right or to the left of your distribution, maybe you can infer that those contexts, they come from a different uh, replicant unit. So maybe they come from a plasmid. 
So that's actually the feature that Plasmid Space is trying to exploit here. So looking at the coverage in order to distinguish plasmids and chromosomes. So, so far we mostly talked about classification. So whether a given contact comes from a plasmid or a, um, uh, or a chromosome, um, but that doesn't tell you which contacts come from, from the same plasmid, right? So that doesn't allow you, for example, to assemble complete plasmids or to, or just to, to classify, to give them identities, right? And uh, why is simple classification not enough? So what, what extra information can we learn from uh, assigning identities to plasmids? Yeah, uh, in, in a classification, we uh, have a binary outcome, either chromosome or plasmids. Uh, there, are, there can be uh, many different plasmids within a bacterial cell. Uh, it depends a lot uh, on the species, how many uh, plasmids we can expect. But we've seen, uh, for Enterococcus faecium at least, we've seen everything from 0 to 11 different plasmids. So if we only have a binary classification, we know this is uh, a sequence from uh, the plasmid or the plasmidome, so all plasmids together, but we cannot... Uh, really pinpoint uh, from which replicons or from which plasmid the, uh, a, a certain uh, sequence or a certain gene comes. Uh, so in order to uh, uh, f uh, see which one of the plasmids contains which genes, we need to bin the plasmidome uh, even further. And to do that, uh, we developed uh, GPLAS, uh, which looks at uh, different features uh, to in order to bin uh, these plasmids even further. Uh, GPLAS uh, looks uh, takes the assembly graph and then uh, looks at the, for one at the connections that are uh, there in the assembly graph, and but also the KMER uh, KMER coverage. So uh, how many times a certain sequence uh, was covered in comparison to the chromosome and uh, also at uh, the KMER distribution. So the probabilities that were given uh, of uh, a certain contact being a chromosome or being from a plasmid. So in, in terms of the like information that... Uh... Uh, maybe an epidemiologist might might care about, right? W why does it matter or does it matter whether some genes are on the same plasmid versus on a different plasmid? Like if we try to make this, uh, uh, to, to make use of this information clinically or epidemiolo epidemiologically, does, does this matter? Yeah, we assume that uh, or we know that not all plasmids can be transferred. There are plasmid, uh, conjugative plasmids that are transferred from one bacteri bacterium to another more easily. So, uh, yes, especially if we look at these uh, notorious uh, antibiotic resistance plasmids, it, it does matter what uh, they have on there and what this plasmid is. Mm -hmm. And is the plasmid identity more or less rigid? So, if you take a, a very broad um, set of isolates uh, of this bacterium, would you observe like a limited set of, of plasmids or do they recombine all the time, do they mix all the time and do you observe like all sorts of, um, you know, variants of these plasmids? It does look as if they recombine frequently and have exhibit a high uh, level of mosaicism. So a mix and match approach. However, it's also the case that we actually don't have that much data on, on plasmids yet because there is a limited amount of uh, bacteria isolates which have been completely sequenced from which we with certainty know all the plasmid sequences. And uh, a lot of the data is only fragmented because we have those uh, fragmented contigs. So I think there's a lot still to explore about uh, stability or mosaicism of plasmids. Okay, and uh, so let's uh, talk about GPLAS. So this is your uh, your tool uh, that you developed to bin these contexts and to, to assign them to uh, distinct plasmids or replication units. Um, so maybe to 
talk about how GPLAS works. And may maybe the first thing we should mention is that GPLAS works sort of downstream of the tools we already talked about, right? So for example, ML Plasmids uh, gives you the classification. Uh, so it tells you which sequences are from plasmids. And only then does it make sense for uh, to, to classify these sequences, uh, to classify them further into distinct plasmids, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So in GPLAS, what we tried was to combine different features and different tools that they were already being used in order to predict plasmids. And we wanted to go one step further and to bin those context predicted as plasmid into different replicant units. So actually what GPLAS does is first a binary classification, either using ML plasmids or PlasFlow. PlasFlow is another tool that is also widely used by the plasmid community in which you can also binary classify a contact as plasmid or chromosome. And that one was also designed for metagenomic samples. So you could also use it for bacterial species in which you don't have a model in ML plasmids. Right. And that happens even after. So uh, to, to be clear, the, the very first stage is assembly, right? So when you get your raw data, yeah, actually, let's, let's talk in detail about your pipeline. So you get the raw data from, from the sequencer, right? You maybe mm -hmm. do some quality control, uh, yes. trim the adapters and so on. Uh, what happens next? So the next step is assembly, right? Yeah, so you will, you will need to do an assembly, for example, using the spades or a unicycler, which actually, for example, tries to optimize the space assembly that you get. And actually, that's the first uh, thing that you need for G+. So there's only one input that you require, and it's actually the assembly graph that you get from, from for example, a space. Right, and that's an interesting notion of, of a, an assembly graph, and we covered this in some other episodes, but let's... Uh... Uh, sort of remind uh, our listeners and ourselves, uh, what is an assembly graph? Yes, yeah, so we have been talking about contexts. So contexts are large sequences that come from, from the assembler. Uh, but usually those contexts are also connected. And that connectivity is present in the assembly graph. So in, a, in, a, in an assembly graph, we have nodes, which are actually my contexts. And those nodes, so those contexts, are connected to other contexts by links. And those links are inferred from the dividing graph, from the assembly, for example, that you can get from space. Right, and and the meaning of these links is that uh, this contig um, likely follows that contig in the in the actual sequence, right? Yes, that's absolutely right. So, in the border of the contigs, what you can find is like there's a reason why the assembler doesn't elongate the contigs that long. Uh, so, for example, the reason why you cannot get complete genomes if you are using a Illumina reads, and that's because when you encounter a repeat sequence, if that repeat sequence cannot be spanned by your read, then the assembler doesn't know whether contig A goes after contig B or contig C, and then it stops there. So that's actually what is the limit in the boundaries of your contigs. And so you run spades, uh, and, and you run unicycler, and they output um, this um, uh, format called GFA. It's a text format uh, popular nowadays, right? So that's just a way to represent the assembly graph. Yes, that's absolutely right. And and then you run ML plasmids on that graph to tell you, basically to classify the nodes, the vertices of the graph into plasmids versus chromosomes. Yes, that's, that's actually the only input that GPLAS requires. It's like the assembly graph that you get. And after that, it does a pipeline, which is fully automated. So mm -hmm. it starts with a binary classification, either using ML plasmids or PlasFlow. So yes. Right. And, and what does it do next? So then it tries to look for what we called unitics. So unitics are particular contexts in which the in degree and out degree of that context is equal to one. So what does it mean? It means like there's only one ingoing connection and outgoing connection coming in or coming out from that particular contig. And that's actually very important because those unitics, so those particular contigs, are uh, we can rely on the coverage that we observe on those contigs. And that's very useful for different features that go after in the pipeline. 
So that's one of the first steps that we also do. So look into the unit ticks. So context that they have an in degree and out degree of one. And we can do that because we have the information in the assembly graph. And, and coverage here uh, means simply how many times on average this contact was, uh, was sequenced. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So what we do is like, because we also know whether those unitics are from the chromosome or from the plasmid, then we looked at unitics that they come from the chromosome, because in that way we can know what is the difference in the coverage that we expect because of technical problems that, for example, we, we face in the library preparation or during the sequencing. So those differences in the coverage are not because are due to difference in the copy number, so are due to technical problems. Oh, that, that's very clever. So you use uh, chromosomes, you rely on the fact that there is just one chromosome per organism, and you use that to calibrate your, uh, your model or your algorithm. That's absolutely right. So that's the main concept behind that part of the pipeline. So looking at the difference in the coverage that we expect, not because of difference in the copy number, only because of technical problems. And then what we do is like, we start walking into the graph. And for doing that, what we do is like, we consider genetics that have been predicted as plasmid. And then what we do is we start creating walks. So it means like if I'm starting for contact A, then I try to elongate these contacts in order to create a path, a walk. And for doing that, what we do is like there's usually different connections that you can accept or reject. And those connections are labeled based on the probabilities of a contact of, of being plasmid or chromosome, but also the probability of that particular contact of being part of that walk. And that's based on the coverage. So we actually assume a normal distribution in which the standard deviation is the difference in the coverage that we observe in our chromosomal context. And then what we see is like, we try to fit, we try to see if that particular coverage of the content that we want to accept can be accepted or not, depending on the work that we have been constructing. So uh, how, how do you handle when, uh, how do you handle the case when the same gene uh, is shared by multiple plasmids, in which case you have sort of this sum of coverages of individual plasmids on a, on a contact? Yes, that's a very good question. In those cases, what we do is like we assigned a default probability of that edge. Um, so we, we kind of say like those contexts, because they are shared in multiple sequence, they do not correspond to unitics. So they have an in or out degree, which is higher than one. And then looking at that particular coverage is not useful for the tool. So what we do is like we give a default uh, probability to those edges. So in some cases, they can be uh, accepted and connected. And later on, if, for example, you have accepted a connection which is wrong, then the rest of the connections will tell you like probably that work that you have been creating is not the correct one. So you assign uh, the probabilities to edges and then you somehow uh, want to disentangle that graph into separate walks with sort of a maximum, maximal set of probabilities? Uh, that's, that's, actually, that's actually right. So what we try to see is like for each plasmid unity that we have predicted, we try to create a, a new, seat, new set of walks. So we try to see what possible connections do we find in our, in our graph. So for example, in that way, we can differentiate the plasmid part from the chromosomal part, but we can also differentiate, for example, contexts that have a very different copy number rather than others that are also in the same genome, but maybe they have a different copy number. So once we have the works generated, what we do is we create a new set of links. So we try to see what plasmid genetics are co-occurring in the same works. And using those links, we create a new network. So we try to go from the assembly graph that we have generated, uh, for example, using the space, to a new network in which we only have connections corresponding to plasmid genetics. You also mentioned that you did a, um, a benchmark of, of different tools to predict um, the uh, plasmid versus chromosome uh, sort of origin of, of a sequence, right? 
Um, and uh, I don't know if you also benchmarked if, if there if there were tools like GPlus and whether you benchmark them, right? And I'm curious from benchmarking those, did you get any insights uh, that helped you to implement these algorithms, design and implement these algorithms? Uh, so yes, yeah, so actually uh, we did a benchmarking, but that benchmarking was more focused onto the binary classification of contexts. But in GPLAS, in the manuscript that it's uh, already available in BioArchive, we did a benchmarking of tools that are um, that can also be used in order to bin plasmid contexts. So, for example, there are several tools that are out there that can also do a similar job as GPLAS. One is uh, HASP, the other is uh, MOB, uh, MOB Recon, uh, Plasmid Spades, or, for example, Recycler. So what we saw is like the combination of looking at the probabilities from the K-mere composition, whether something is plasmid and chromosome, looking at the assembly graph, and looking at the coverage of the contact, merging those three together is the key in order to do a better binning as, for example, other tools. How do you combine those sources of data? How do you figure out, you know, when there is a contradiction, for example, between those sources? How like in which proportions to, to combine them? It, it was actually quite challenging, especially the first part of looking into the graph. So actually the idea of coming up with walks. So at first, our first idea was to try to create all the walks that they were possible in the assembly graph. But that's, it requires a lot of, uh, it's very expensive from a point of view of, of computation. So at some point, we, we also saw like it was more interesting to look into the plasmid unitics and try to look into them. And then if, for example, a contic has been wrongly predicted as chromosome uh, and it was actually a plasmid, but actually the coverage is telling you that it may actually look at, a, it may actually be part of a plasmid. I think the combination of those two, it's actually what makes GPLAS so successful because then you are not relying into a single feature in order to predict something as plasmid or chromosome. So you are actually looking also at the coverage and if a contact can be connected or not based on assembly graph. So I think when we merge those three, what we are actually doing is like if one of the three features is given a contradiction, we still have other two features and then we rely on the combination of the three to see whether a connection is uh, is right or maybe it's wrong. Are you aware of um, any limitations with the, with your current algorithm, or is it in a in a perfect state already? So what we realized was like there was a main limitation behind G plus, and that was when we were exploring plasmids that they have a very similar copy number. So usually plasmids with a similar copy number they also share repeat sequence. It means like if we look at the assembly graph those contexts are also be going to be connected. And if we look at the probabilities of being plasmid and at the probabilities of being part of the same uh, plasmid based on the coverage, that's actually going to be a higher probability. So at some point in our final network, those contexts are going to be part of the same bin. And that's actually one of the problems that we are still facing with G+. Yeah, that, that, that must be very tough, right? Because uh, do you know any features or any pieces of information that would help you to disentangle this, or, or is this hopeless? I think long-read sequencing information uh, could help you disentangle ah, uh, right. such plasmids, yeah. There's actually also something else that we could look at it. So uh, we, we also talk about uh, like uh, the presence of replication genes uh, can also be a feature to predict whether something is plasmid or chromosome. If we will find, for example, the same uh, replication machinery twice in the same bin, that will give you an indication that maybe there are two plasmids merged together. Right, right. Oh, that's a very good point. All right, so now you have a tool to um, to predict uh, the origin of a sequence and you have a tool to uh, bin them into distinct plasmids. Um, so what are you going to work next? I think the next step will be to apply it to a large collection of data to determine indeed uh, this transfer of, uh, of uh, uh, hospital outbreaks, whether we have more plasmid outbreaks or whether we look at clonal outbreaks solely.
And I think uh, the advantage, the bitter advantage of both tools, amoplasmin and Gplas, is that they uh, can be scaled up quite nicely. They don't need to have, to have any manual uh, interference, and we can apply them on thousands of isolates. And also, we're currently working on a, a new model for amoplasmids for Yacinetobacto baumani, which I think will also be really uh, an interesting uh, species. And what, what what exactly do you mean when you say you're working on, on a new model? So um, do you want to just train that on, on that species? or? Yes, indeed, indeed. So in order to uh, train a new model, uh, we need to have enough uh, um, complete genomes. And it's either we produce them ourselves or we wait until they turn up in the database. <laughs> and in this case, we hope to have enough uh, uh, complete genome for Asinetobacter baumani to in order to build a model. Mm -hmm. And how does the performance compare when you when you trade a model specifically for the species? versus you use some kind of generic model or you use a model trained on a, on a different species because you still have those sort of universal features that we talked about, but maybe your uh, machine learning component isn't, isn't as great, right? Uh, so what kind of performance uh, comparison do you see? So actually what we have seen this is like, for example, if you use G plus in combination with PlusFlow, which is like a general model in order to predict plasmids. So it can also be used for metagenomic samples. In those cases, sometimes you are predicting a quantic as part of, a, as currently predicted as, as plasmid. So you are actually predicting chromosome quantics as plasmids. And that can really difficult things for G plus. So what we have seen is like at some point, what you will do is, start merging chromosomal contexts with contexts coming from plasmids with a copy number of one, so copy number similar to the chromosome, and that really makes a difference. So um, in our benchmarking in, in, the, in the paper, which is available in BioArchive, we saw like the performance of combining G plus and ML plasmids is much better rather than if you combine G plus together with ML plasmids. So I think uh, the take home message here was like, the initial prediction that you make is actually really important in order to uh, get the right beans out of it. Right, but if we talk specifically about the prediction part, so if you take specifically ML plasmids, and if you run a model, if you run the algorithm with the right model trained on these species versus uh, a model trained on a different species, what sort of uh, uh, the performance difference are we talking about yeah what what we usually see is like if for example you we have trained a model for enterococcus physium for example that's one of the species that we work in the hospital and then you try it for a different bacterial species for example something coming from uh, a gram negative bacterial species so uh, a completely different they are not phylogenetically related what you see is like the probabilities given by the by the models in this case by the support vector machine are really close to 0 0.5 meaning like the the model is giving you a prediction of course it's telling you whether something is plasmid or chromosome but actually the probability so the posterior probability of that contact is actually really close to 0 0.5 which indicates you like you cannot really trust a prediction but but uh, you have those other sources of information, right? So do, do they contribute something? Like you, you should still get higher performance than 0 0.5 because you're integrating those generic things as well, right? Yes, exactly. So at, at some point, if you combine also the probability of the coverage, then it can go higher or lower. So for example, if the assembly graph is quite neat and then you see like that's the only possible connection, then at some point you will accept that connection, so that can also really help. But if 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 you look at the binary classification first, and as you said, uh, what about if you train like a more general model? What we see is like then the problem is much more challenging. But I think it it can also be useful, and you can also play with the parameters of G plus in order to relax or be more stringent while you are accepting or rejecting connections. Well, Sergio, Anita, um, that's a very cool work and, and very important as well, right? So thanks for 
doing the podcast. Thank you for having us. Thank you for the invitation, Roman.